choosing. There we go. And then all right, slideshow from the beginning. All right, here we are. So um, before we go into it, I should tell everyone that uh, you know radio uh, between basically 1927 when NBC started and about maybe 1950 or so, it was the mass medium. It was actually more expensive in the late 1940s to advertise on the radio than it was on burgeoning television. Uh, and uh, another thing is it was a live medium and everything you're going to hear was originally done live and you generally won't hear any mistakes. Very, very rarely did they. They really operated on the clock. And uh, another thing is, is that technologically, these were all recorded on uh, these large Bakelite 16-inch electrical transcription discs. And so they that's how they saved them. And the reason why they saved them was that it was just too expensive to do every show uh, live. I mean, so it would, if NBC had like 200 radio stations, they would make these transcription discs and send them out to their affiliates. And so that's why we still have them. And they've gone through many technological changes. They've gone from the transcription discs. About 25 years later, they went to reel-to-reel -reel tape. Uh, they went to cassette tape. They went to compact disc. And they went on there to streaming. And you could literally find literally hundreds of thousands of podcasts and uh, all different kinds of sites uh, and sh playing all of these old radio broadcasts. And they're a lot of fun to listen to once you get used to their style. But uh, another thing I have to put in the plug is to Bing Crosby. Everybody knows that I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, but he had actually a more a profound effect because he was able to literally drag this live medium into an area an era of tape and he did it because he didn't like having to do a program twice and we'll get into that later why that had to be done and uh, so he invested in the Ampex Corporation and uh, he promoted it to the point where uh, when his contract with NBC and uh, Kraft was expiring, he told them with the new contract, he wanted to have everything, what they said, transcribed. And they both refused. They thought that the shows had more appeal if they were live. So they both refused. So he literally blew off his sponsor of many years and his network of many years and he went to the then new American Broadcasting Company network and he got a new sponsor, Philco Radios, Philco Radio Time. And he did basically the same show, but they let him tape it. And he had such star power that everyone was saying, well, if Der Bingle is doing it, why aren't we doing it? So just to give you, like I said, a small plug for someone you hear a lot of this time of year. So let's get going. Okay, I found this postcard on the web. I thought it was really cute. It is some of the old radio personalities like Bing, some old radios. And it says, Merry Christmas from the land that time forgot. And it's not quite as forgotten as you might think. Uh, some of these selections are gonna be from comedy, drama, a little bit of everything. And these are some of the people you'll be hearing, uh, Burns and Allen, Jack Benny and Mary Livingstone and President Roosevelt, which I thought was very interesting. I think you'll like him. Now, this is where we get into to having to do the same show twice because of our four time zones. You couldn't do the same show and have the whole country hear it at the same time. So since it was done live, it had to be done twice. So the programs would be repeated live for both coasts, uh, actors, tech people, 
you know, they had to be paid again because they were working again. AT&T uh, leased lines to carry, you know, the broadcast because it was considered to be more reliable than radio towers. And, uh, and then, like I said, you know, in order to cut down on expenses, they saved them, transcribed these discs and sent out hundreds of copies to wherever station actually needed them. And that's why there's called transcription. So you can see all of these different <laughs> kinds of formats that are available now. So it's really remarkable how they've just marched along technologically with all the rest of us. And this shows you, you can't read the individual things, sorry to say, but this shows you what a busy medium this was in its heyday. Uh, this is just one day, Christmas day in 1942. And, you know, it was a very serious time. I mean, Americans really needed it. I mean, you know, they say the movies provided a lot of morale, but, you know, the radio was in your home. <laughs> and uh, in a way, being more immediate, you didn't have to, you know, leave your home, get, uh, get on a streetcar, go downtown, go into a movie theater. So this is, you know, very typical of why radio was needed in those days. So anyway, here's our first program. Uh, this is the DuPont Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. And there's an excellent backstory to this because in the 1930s, they were getting a well-deserved reputation for being uh, an arms merchant because uh, between their chemicals and their explosives, they were uh, the Italians were using them on helpless Ethiopian citizens. And later on, the, the Germans and the, uh, the Spanish fascists would use them again on helpless civilians in the Spanish War in 1939. So anyway, it was damage control. They wanted to be more warm. They wanted to be more fuzzy in the eyes of the American people. And it largely worked. And I think you'll sort of get an idea about this program because Frank Morgan, you know him, he was the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. And uh, he's a, a mythical conductor on a train trip across the United States. And it dramatizes how some places got their strangest names. Uh, my, my personal favorite was Difficult Tennessee, which I wish I could have shown with it, but it, it's a little too long. But basically, a town in Tennessee who applied for a post office gave a, a name that was Native American. And the response from the post office was that we have decided that the name of your town is difficult. And so they adopted difficult as the name of their town. So anyway, let's get going. And so you can hear Mr. Morgan. Pressure is up, and we're off on the second leg of our swift journey across America on this peacetime Christmas Eve. If this alphabetical train of ours is ever to get to Z, we've got to cut down the repartee and also the fiddle dee dee. Oh, up there, take the time <laughs> while I cogitate on the next letter in the alphabet. Hey, sir. Well, that shouldn't be so hard. Let's see. I've got it. A ain't I. This program comes to you as a Christmas program should from the NBC studios out in Hollywood. <laughs> Hey, our uh, next program is the Chase and Sanborn Hour. And uh, this was one of the most popular shows from those years. Uh, and actually, 
uh, Orson Welles and his famous Martian broadcast, that was their competition. And uh, the Mercury Theater could count on about maybe a million faithful listeners as compared to the 17 million listeners that Jason Sanborn could definitely offer. And supposedly they had a role in the War of the World's Panic because uh, channel surfing was invented long before uh, remote controls and television. And they were supposedly at 8.15, the uh, commercial was coming on for the coffee and some people spun the dial to CBS in time to hear an excited reporter describing this strange cylinder opening up in the New Jersey field and all hell broke out later on. Anyway, uh, in this program, this is in the years when uh, Eka Bergen and Charlie McCarthy <clears throat> appeared on the program and uh, this scenario was that uh, he was supposed to uh, learn this poem, A Visit from Old St. Nick, which, you know, it was the night before Christmas and all through the house and to get a present, but he didn't learn the poem because that was bad boy McCarthy. And so he just literally massacres his way through the entire poem, poem at the urging of, you know, uh, and prompting by Edgar Bergen. So it's really funny because back then there were no laugh tracks. So you definitely knew the audience was really, really laughing. Uh, and uh, one of the things was is that uh, uh, they also had ran a wire to the Great Lakes Naval Air Station where you could listen to a 1000 voice male choir singing a medley of Christmas carols. So let's listen. And this is introduced by Don Amici. You may remember him from Cocoon and other films. Well, he was not only the MC, but he was also one of the players. The makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee bring you Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Don Amici. from your Yule Log, Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> oh, thank you, Don. My pal, my friend. You know, you're the nicest Don Amici I know. Uh-oh. Yes, you are. When you talk like that, I know you want something. What is it, Charlie? Well, it just so happens you're right this time. I do need help. You see, Bergen said that I, if I would recite the night before Christmas this evening, mm -hmm. he'd give me a special Christmas present. Well, it's fine. Have you memorized it? Uh, well, part of it, that's all. Which part? Uh, just the title. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Well, uh, make Bergen forget about the vote, but not about the presents. <laughs> well, no, yeah. let me see. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got it. Why don't you say that after you learned it, a blow on the head made you forget it? Yeah, duh. That's good, that's good, that's good. Yeah, and I'll be glad to cooperate with a baseball bat. That's that, that's that, that's that. But now look, why should I help you? Why, why didn't you learn the poem in the first place? Well, I was, I was just too busy, Don. Busy doing what? Well, I was one thing or another. I was playing hooky for a sick friend. <laughs> just in time to hear Charlie recite that lovely Christmas poem, The Night Before Christmas, by Clement Clark Moore. <laughs> I bet he wouldn't have written it if he had a memo. I should do. All right, Charlie, go ahead and recite it. Well, I, uh, I can recite it much better, Bergen, uh, if from memory, if uh, with a book in front of me. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. I'll give the introduction. No, no doubt. Bad, bad, Miss Noble. No doubt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are now about to hear that famous classic, The Night Before Christmas, perpetrated by Charlie McCarthy. Oh, no. Cut it out, fellas. This is so embarrassing. No. Now, you go right ahead and recite it, Charlie. No, please, Danny. No. Now, you mustn't be nervous. Well, I've always been timid. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you go right ahead, Charlie. No, please. Charlie, go right ahead. Do you, you. 
Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you mustn't be nervous. I have a lot of nerves, Charlie. <laughs> Remember, no recitation, no present. Now we're all right waiting to hear about Santa Claus. Well, I'll try. There ought to be one down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're waiting. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Santa Revere. No. <laughs> don't tell me after all. Yes, yes, you're a little confused. Well, I'm a couple of nerds. Yes, yes, I don't remember. Now you start with... Second, everybody. I saw that some people were not hearing the volume just right. So just give me one second. You know, while we're adjusting this, these were recorded a long time ago with a totally different technology. So we'll do our, the best we can. Give me just a second. We'll try something different here. Yes, under the spreading Christmas tree. Yeah. Let me know in the uh, comments Santa if it's louder. Stands. No, no, no. Perhaps if I just help you with a little start, that would be good. Yeah. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. He can't, Bergen, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. And believe me, you felt good to get rid of them, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Now, what's the next line? Uh -huh. I see. What's the next line? The next line? Yes. Oh, there's more, isn't there? Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's all through the house, all through the house. Uh, let's see. Uh, quiet, please, Buck. <laughs> What's the next line, fellas? No, 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 no. No, not a, what, remember what is it? Yeah, okay. Not a creature was stirring, not even a louse. No, no, no. no. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. And that's the way it goes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. The stockings were hung, huh? Stockings were hung where? On a nail. No, no. <laughs> the stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes. In hopes? In hopes. In hopes that the laundry man soon would be there. No. No. <laughs> no. In hopes that Saint, Saint who? Saint Vitus? No. <laughs> St. Bernard, no, no. St. Paul, no, no. Minneapolis, no, no, wait. <laughs> well, gee whiz, I tried. All right. I'm on the wrong track. You certainly are. I'm going to hate myself in the morning for not knowing this. Yeah. Well, now you continue. Yes. Let's see. Wait, wait, wait. In hopes. Oh, yes, yes. In hopes. In hopes. <laughs> No coaching, please. Yeah. <laughs> Much. <laughs> In hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. Santa call him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the children were nestled all snug in their bed. Shoot if you must this old gray head. <laughs> well, I give up. Charlie, surely you know the part about Santa Claus. What part? Yeah. The arms and legs? No, 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 no. no. How about how he rides through the skies? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, Santa Claus is right. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. He flies through the air with the greatest of ease. The jolly fat man in the red DVDs. <laughs> Well, that part I'm a little rusty on, right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially right around there. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll tell you, it goes this way. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter. What'd you do? I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Oh, yeah. I tore open the shutters and threw up the, the sash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now, what about the reindeers? Oh, what about them? Yeah. What were their names? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. 
What were they? Well, there's Dancer and Prancer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what are the rest of them? Uh, there's Dancer and Prancer and... And, uh, and Dandruff and Blinces. No. <laughs> Hey, here's to choir. Uh, it is not a thousand people, but I think this picture sort of gives you a picture of it. And uh, they uh, did a, a remote hookup from Chicago. They could, they could do that and they could even do overseas. It was getting very, very advanced by this point, the technology. <laughs>
Okay, before we leave here, I want to share this wonderful story about Great Lakes Naval Air Station because one of their principal jobs was to train aviators and they call themselves aviators rather than pilots because it's much more difficult to take off and land on a moving vessel like an aircraft carrier. And this is uh, was sort of a problem when war started because we only had seven of them and they were all needed in the Pacific War and none could be risked to do training all the pilots they would need off either the Pacific or the Atlantic coast. And so this is what they did. The government purchased two Great Lakes excursion steamers, the C and B and the Wolverine and converted them into carriers. And they trained hundreds of young men to fly and land on these things. And they were definitely sort of for Frankenstein creation because they are probably the only coal fired paddle wheel aircraft carriers in the entire universe. But that's what they were and that's what they did. And there's, they still find literally hundreds of wrecked planes where pilots didn't quite make it and crashed into the lake and were rescued and they just, you know, bought out more planes. And so, you know, before we moved on, even though it has nothing to do with radio, I thought you would like the story. Um, now, this was a very popular show, the first night or program, they would do 30 minute plays. And every week it was a different story. And, uh, but this is something they did every single Christmas. And uh, uh, it was about the birth of the infant Jesus in Bethlehem. And at the time, the shows had a lot more visible religious feeling than is common today. And so it was definitely a different era. And uh, now the principals were Ulan Sule and Barbara Luddy, and they play Mary and Joseph. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, Ulan Sule, when you see his picture, you might possibly look a little familiar. He was very much a fixture as a supporting player in many films in the 1940s and 50s. And uh, Luddy chose to stay in radio, so there's really no movies about her. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, I, the intro was really interesting because it showed Mr. First Nighter going through Times Square and describing all the Christmas lights and the taxis and, and paper, get your paper, please. And so anyway, uh, but it was actually broadcast from the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. But it sort of gave that sort of New York type ambience and here they are. Here, Mary. We can clear out this little space and be comfortable. Let me spread the blanket for you. You are so good to me, Joseph. You're tired, Mary. There. Now lie down. Could you not bring the beast in out of the cold? It is cold. Tough enough to 
thing for governor. Uh, I must go back to work. That is true, sir. One does not. No, I should put in at this point that, I mean, everyone who was on the air then did a Christmas program with one major exception. One of the most popular programs on the air then was a program called Inner Sanctum. And because of their sort of ghoulish sound effects and their uh, werewolves and vampire fare, they didn't even try <laughs> to, to sort of fit Christmas into their format. So they just simply didn't broadcast that week. And uh, they just went back to their usual stuff. But they were, they were quite a program. One of their most famous sound effects was to have a man turned inside out by a demonic fog. And what they did that was that they coated a rubber glove in glycerin and pulled it inside out while another sound man crushed a berry basket to indicate the bones being crushed <laughs> under the mic. So it, it, that's the kind of program it was. So definitely not a Christmas program. And uh, here's George Burns and Gracie Allen. They uh, appeared on several different shows, but they got strong enough that Day 1936, they went on to NBC and then later CBS networks and then stayed on radio until they went to television in 1950. And they played seven seasons there and when Gracie retired. And you can find the show in multiple uh, formats, tape, DVD, MP3, streaming, they're all over the place. Christmas and in the Burns house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Oops, my mistake, George is stirring. You know, Gracie, I just can't get over this beautiful Christmas present Eddie Candy gave me. A hundred and ten dollars for me, Jack. Yes, it's hard to believe, all right, but there's the price tag hanging right on it. <laughs> that was probably an oversight on the part of some toy. Eddie would die if he knew it was on there. Well, then why did the Cigar 
drugstore and be me when they see my teeter tongue. I'll hide it behind my back and say, guess what? No. And they'll say, golf clubs, fishing tackle, and I'll say, no, a teeter tongue. <laughs> Hey, now, this is one of the lesser known acts on uh, radio, but it was literally one of the best programs of the late radio era before TV started coming in. And uh, it actually went into uh, the television age, 1946 to 1954. And uh, years later, someone asked uh, Alice Faye why they didn't bring it to television. And Phil, she said, decided not to because uh, they felt that their irreverent tone, uh, they had a lot of jokes about him uh, uh, drinking too much. And uh, so uh, like one of their, uh, on, uh, he also appeared occasionally on Jack Benny's show where he had started as the band leader. And one show I remember they, uh, he was complaining about uh, all the frantic women sh shoppers and said, uh, and somebody asked him, did you, did you get beat up too much? And he said, yeah, I probably deserved it. So anyway, they always made uh, a time for them to do a song. And so this is them doing uh, their own individual songs in, in their one of their typical programs. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Passing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on Bob Hill ring. No, I have to say that Jingle Bells was positively exhausting. It must have taken them most of the week to be letter perfect on this thing because uh, failure was not an option on old time radio. 
they were going, of course, going to see Jack Benny. Um, and I mean, like Burns and Allen, he started as a guest. In fact, actually, a lot of big radio acts started on the Rudy Valley Fleischmann's East Tower, and Valley himself got something of a reputation of being a star maker. And uh, but anyway, Benny uh, got qualified for his own show by 1932, and uh, he was one of the very, very last. Uh, popular radio programs on the air in 1954 at the sponsor and network surging, he reluctantly went into television and uh, he did it till 1965. Uh, the reason why he quit, I discovered, was that he just felt he wasn't being appreciated. Uh, the baby boomers were starting to be old enough to the uh, consumers and so basically the networks and the movies were starting to get into a youth kick. And uh, a lot of shows, old, older actors uh, wound up in either quitting themselves or just being canceled. In fact, Red Skelton was so insulted when he was canceled that he bought up all of his shows and he pledged to have all of them destroyed upon his death um, uh, luckily for us, other people got into that and they managed to save them. So they are still available. And, uh, but anyway, uh, a funny anecdote is that uh, uh, the Fraser show, Kelsey Grammer, he was a very big admirer of Benny. And he basically did, did the same format, which was called a show within a show where the characters play variations on their actual selves. And I always saw Roz as the sarcastic Mary Livingstone character on The Benny Show. And they had a lot in common, both of them. Uh, just as a sideline, believe it or not, George Burns and his autobiography, he did not like Mary Livingstone. He felt she had no talent that she beleaguered her husband to force her way onto his show. And um, I tend to disagree, but that was his take on it. And uh, so anyway, this is cut is from uh, one of Jack's legendary Christmas shopping shows. Uh, and he did them every year. Sometimes they were shopping, sometimes they occasionally they would be returning a gift and uh, he was uh, played with uh, Mel Blanc, who is was a Bugs Bunny What's Up Doc fame. And here they go. Uh, Dad, uh, what do you mean by that? I don't know, Mary. Some little joke, I guess. Now, come on, let's go and see. Oh, Mary. Now, I just thought of something. Not again. Come on with me. It'll only take a minute. Oh, clerk. Clerk. Here's the package. Got it up from the delivery room. I'll go on and sign the car. No, no, no. That's not important now. I want to change the wallet. <laughs> what? Instead of the forty-dollar one, I'll take the one that costs a dollar ninety-eight. Gee, he was such a young fellow. <laughs> Well, I'll take the dollar ninety-eight wallet and put the money in his hand. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go. Well, there's quite a more where that came from. I mean, on the Internet Archive, he has an entire page of all of his shows. And like I said, the Christmas shopping shows, some of them are really very, very funny. I'd have to say all basically the comedy, if you do go into them, by our standards is really more sentimental and sort of corny, but uh, sometimes they can still be extremely funny. So you just have to see it for yourself. Oh, of course we can't do this without having some sort of a commercial. It's your house. Somebody would like to serve a cup of coffee or some refreshment along with a snack. Well then be sure to order some of the seven delicious Kraft cheese spreads tomorrow morning. A few glasses of Kraft cheese spreads Set out with some crackers or potato chips, and your snacks are ready in a twinkling. 
But with all the holiday buying, I suppose that point budget of yours is strained. So I want to mention in passing that four grand varieties of Kraft cheese spreads take just two points apiece. They're the perfect appetizer spreads. Pimento, olive pimento, roca, and relish. All creamy in texture, all delicious. Now that grocery list for tomorrow's shopping is long, I know. So it'd be a smart idea to make a note on it right now. Just jot down Kraft cheese spreads. Folks will be mighty glad you remember. Hey, here's probably a program you've never heard, but it was the longest running show on old time radio. It lasted 27 years with the whole cast basically intact. And uh, it involved a, a San Francisco based husband and wife, Henry and Fanny Barber, and they had five children. So they were Paul, the oldest, Hazel, his sister, Clifford and Claudia, the twins, and Jack, the youngest, provide plenty of material. In fact, uh, uh, the actor who played Jack, he was young enough to actually be drafted in World War II. So they just simply rewrote the story to have letters coming from him that the family would read. And when the war ended, he just came back and as a returning war veteran and just kept going. But uh, in some ways, like one critic said, this show moved almost with the slowness of life itself. And yet they had some interesting sidelights. Uh, strange, some of the issues were strangely modern, um, it, like Hazel and her husband, Paul, uh, he, their son, Pinky, came back from working in a logging cab uh, and he was just rolling in money and they just couldn't figure out where he was getting it from. And they were debating whether they should search his room uh, to find out. So it was sort of an interesting program. And, you know, the fact that they had played together so long, I really think it gave a great sort of family, authentic family feel to it. sort of special treat. Um, it was customary then for the president to speak on Christmas Eve or Christmas. Uh, this particular time, it was the lighting of, of the Christmas tree, which was just 10, just about a week or so after Pearl Harbor. And uh, Prime Minister Churchill was visiting. And there's a lot of stories about him in the White House Supposedly, one of the male servants came in and found him standing in his room completely naked with a cigar. But anyway, uh, the tree, which had actually dated back to the Coolidge administration in 1923, was always outside on Lafayette Square. But for wartime security reasons, the 
they decided that it had to be done within the grounds of the White House, and it's been there ever since. And uh, David Brinkley, if you you remember him from Huntley and Brinkley, he wrote a wonderful book some years ago about wartime Washington, and he had an interesting anecdote about this, saying that people were allowed to come in, but they could not bring in parcels, again, for security. So uh, what he said people did is that they placed them propped up against the wall supporting the fence uh, and just left them there out on the street and went in through the ceremony. Uh, I don't know if there were any porch pirates or sidewalk pirates, but he didn't say if anyone found anything missing when they came back out. So here we go. Thus the giant rang out and the tree springs into life further down from the south portico of the White House. Fellow workers for freedom. There are many men and women in America, sincere and faithful men and women, who are asking themselves this Christmas, how can we light our tree? How can we give our gifts? How can we meet and worship with love with uplifted spirit and heart in a world of war, a world of fighting and suffering and death. How can we pause, even for a day, even for Christmas Day, in our urgent labor of arming a decent humanity against the enemies which beset it? How can we put the world aside as men and women put the world aside in peaceful years to rejoice in the birth of Christ? These are natural, inevitable questions in every part of the world which is resisting the evil thing. And even as we ask these questions, we know the answer. There is another preparation demanded of this nation beyond and beside the preparation of weapons and materials of war. There is demanded also of us the preparation of our hearts, the arming of our hearts. And when we make ready our hearts for the labor and the suffering and the ultimate victory which lie ahead, then we observe Christmas Day with all of its memories, all of its meaning, as we should. Well, that's not the whole speech, but I think you get the idea of what he was trying to say. He was extremely eloquent, probably one of the most eloquent presidents we have probably ever had. And I find the message somewhat strangely resonant in this troubled Christmas season. So I hope you definitely enjoyed that. Now, uh, we're going to bring Orson Welles. And uh, what happened, remember I told, spoke about the War of the Worlds broadcast? Well, before that, the CBS network was subsidizing the program for, you know, they still sort of believed in uplift, sort of the Victorian thing where we had to sort of educate <laughs> people. And, uh, but uh, once the notoriety gave the show, I mean, uh, this radio show uh, pulled uh, Hitler off the front pages of American uh, newspapers for three whole days. So that's saying something. And he just got literally scooped up by Campbell Soups. And the program changed itself to the Campbell Playhouse, which he played until 
he went to Hollywood to make Citizen Kane. But uh, a constant program that they always did was uh, Lionel Barrymore, who was uh, Drew's great uncle and uh, playing Ebenezer Scrooge. And uh, they did this program every year. In fact, actually, Barrymore did it for many, many years. And in your picture, you'll see him seated, which was not that unusual, but in his case, it was sort of necessary because for health reasons, he lost his ability to walk. And if you see his films from the 30s to the early 50s, he is always in a chair, a wheelchair, a regular chair, some sort of chair. Um, he played Dr. Gillespie in the popular Dr. Kildare series. Oh, and he was actually in a wheelchair, and that was the reason why. But uh, I'm just giving it a, a very end, just to give you a flavor of how good Barry Moore was. And he was very highly in demand. He did it 30 minute versions for one sponsor, full hour versions for another sponsor. I mean, like everybody wanted to hear him do Scrooge. So if you go on to the old time radio site, definitely listen to the entire broadcast. It's really quite, quite good. Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came, his hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too, he's on his stool in the jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Yeah, 21 and six and carry the one and 24 and carry the two, 31 and eight and nine. Hello, hello, Cratchit. Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Well, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. You are. Well, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It should not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge, are you quite yourself, sir? No. No, thank heaven. I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary, and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. Huh? <laughs> we'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoky bishop. Bob, make a fire. Make it up, and, and buy another coal scuttle before you dart another eye. All right. <laughs> Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh. A little he did them. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, 
God bless us, everyone. of Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, starring Lionel Barrymore, brought to you by the makers of Campbell Soups. And now, here is Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in the program, it's my custom, as you know, to present you with a few words of introduction, our guest of the evening. With your consent, I shall dispense with this tonight. To introduce tonight's guest to the Campbell Playhouse audience, or to any American audience, is an extravagant and superfluous procedure. For if ever an actor has won for himself a lasting place in the hearts of his fellow countrymen through years of unsparing and inspiring service, that actor is Lionel Barrymore. Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Oh, thank you, Orson Welles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is the fourth year I've had the pleasure of appearing in the Christmas Carol here on the Candle Playhouse, and I assure you all it's a pleasure that never tires. As long as I can remember, this has been one of my favorite stories. When we were children, it was read to us regularly at this time of year, as it is to many millions of children right now. And like many of them, I'm sure, the three of us, Ethel, Jack, and I, with the aid of a sheet and some old ironware, made a play of it. As I remember, we had three Scrooges in that production. Uh, who played Tiny Tim? I think we had three tiny tins, too. <laughs> but seriously, I can think of no part that I've enjoyed playing again and again as much as I have the part of that squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, Ebenezer Scrooge. And I can think of no happier or more suitable choice for the makers of Campbell Soups to offer the people of America as their Christmas present each year, than Charles Dickens' well-beloved story, A Christmas Carol. Good night, Orson. Good night, everybody. And a merry, merry Christmas to you all. Good night to you, Mr. Barrymore. Thank you, sir, and a merry Christmas to you. Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday night, we're happy to announce our version of a great and truly American story by a great American novelist, Come and Get It, by Edna Ferber. Against a background of the mighty forests of Miss Ferber's own Wisconsin, it tells a stirring tale of the men and women who live and die in the woods, in order that lumber may come down the rivers every spring into the cities of the modern world. Like so many of Miss Ferber's epic romances of American life, it was made from a best-selling novel into a highly successful motion picture. Now we bring it to you on the air. The story of a man and his son and the girl they both love, Lotta. Lotta, played for us by one of the loveliest and most accomplished of Hollywood's younger dramatic actresses, Miss Francis D. So until next week, until come and get it, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse remain as always obedient for yours. But just one moment, please, Benny. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, it's the night before Christmas. And all through the Campbell Playhouse, not a creature is stirring that doesn't join Lionel Barrymore in wishing you a merry, merry Christmas. This goes for all of us, for my sponsor, myself, or for all of us, from Don McBain, who runs the machinery in the control room, to Miss Helgren, who types the Campbell Playhouse scripts, a Merry Christmas. From Benny Herman and his band of Merry Melodians, Merry Christmas. From Max Sayers, a uh, canary-throated chorister, a Merry, Merry Christmas. And from Harry Essman and Cliff Thorson and his crew of sound effect technicians, a Merry Christmas. And from Orson Welles and his considerable aggregation of dramatic talent, who include, among others, Mr. Everett Sloan, Mr. Frank Reddick, Mr. Erskine Sanford, Mr. George Kouris, Mr. Ray Collins, Ms. Georgia Backus, Ms. B. Benaderet, and many, many others. A Merry Christmas. How about it, everybody? A Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's right. And now, as Tiny Tim says... God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Makers 
of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you Edna Ferber's Come and Get It with Miss Frances D. as our guest. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed our fifth annual presentation of A Christmas Carol, won't you tell your grocer so this week when you order Campbell Soups? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and a very Merry Christmas to you all. Just thought I'd tell you, I met Tiny Tim <laughs> a long time ago, uh, and that he had some interesting stories to tell about the Mercury Theater, later Campbell's Playhouse. Uh, if you're not familiar with Edna Ferber, uh, Miss Ferber, her most famous novel was The Showboat, and uh, another one that's still well known is Cimarron. And uh, lastly, uh, Bernard Herrmann. Uh, later on, he would go on to write the scores for some Hitchcock films like Vertigo and a number of other things. So you don't know his name. You've definitely heard his music when you see these movies. And earlier, you may remember they were talking about a uh, person, Alan with Meredith Wilson. If that sounds vaguely familiar, he wrote The Music Man. So I just wanted to clue you into some interesting things, the backgrounds of some of these people who were in this medium. And uh, this concludes this broadcast. And I want to wish you the very best of the season. And uh, we are going to uh, stop this program. Okay, we're back. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, I'm here. <laughs> okay, Tom, if we don't have any questions by anybody, I see that we've had a couple thank yous from some people individuals who uh, were listening to the program. Um, but uh, if we don't have any questions, we can go ahead and end the session. All right, we will do so. So happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>